On Monday, I was waiting on the local Points West and ITV News down here to hear all about uh, our guest we've got now, David Miller, having won his employment tribunal. Uh, well done, David. Well done. <laughs> and uh, it's nice and good to hear about people winning employment tribunals, especially when they're sacked by the great and the good of Bristol University, these incredibly intelligent people who seem to be slowly but surely becoming some sort of mega profit-making corporation, trying to bring in as many foreign um, students as possible possible because they get more money from those foreign students but anyway that by the by um can you can you just uh, uh, take us right back to the start of all of this i mean it was a landmark success it's been called by the evening standard um over israel comments but right at the very start of all this there was uh, there was a lobby group wasn't there within the university that accused you of anti-semitism well, right at the start, there were two students in my class who complained to a uh, external Israel lobby group who made a complaint on their behalf. The university rejected the complaint because they weren't students. And what were you saying to these students? What were you teaching <clears> these students? I was teaching, uh, I did a lecture about Islamophobia, a lecture I've done on, on a number of occasions. Uh, and part of that lecture, about five minutes of it, and you can listen to it online since it was leaked, a recording of it was leaked to the Jewish news and they put it on their site thinking it was uh, you know, condemnatory of me, which of course it wasn't. Uh, I was talking about the, way, the role of the Zionist movement as one of the pillars uh, out of five uh, pushing forward and promoting Islamophobia in this country, which comes from the research I'd been doing at that stage for some 10 years. Uh, and they objected to this. Um, and the, 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 when the, the, the lobby group complained, the university rejected the complaint. And then the lobby group corralled the Union of Jewish Students, which, of course, is also a Zionist organization, into complaining. And they corralled the president of the Bristol Jewish Society, which is a member of the Union of Jewish Students. And they complained. And because she... The, Union of Jewish, the, the Bristol Jewish Society's president was a student at the time, they accepted the complaint. They investigated it, they found I wasn't guilty of anti-Semitism, she appealed, they stayed the appeal until they'd introduced the IHRA definition of, of, of anti-Semitism, which of course changed the rules. Then they investigated me with a QC who found not anything I'd ever said was anti-Semitic, and then they decided that that, that was fine, there was no problem, no case to answer. Six weeks later, this is the short version. Six weeks <laughs> later, I said I have been attacked and complained about by uh, by uh, these two particular uh, organisations, and then all hell breaks loose. You can't possibly. Yes, this is intimidation of students. I'm, I'm just simply reporting factually what happened to me. Massive campaign in uh, the country, in the parliament, in press. Over a hundred members of the. Houses of Lords and Commons wrote to get me sacked, Zionist professors at my university, Zionist professors outside the university, a huge long list of Zionist groups complained, maybe 30 different Zionist groups complained, asked me to be sacked. They investigated me again, found that I had not said anything which was anti-Semitic, surprise, and then sacked me anyhow because... Uh, the conduct uh, that I had uh, um, um, shown them wasn't uh, fit for uh, an academic. And what they meant by that was that some students had been upset, i.e. Zionist students didn't like that I was an anti-Zionist. They said it wasn't anything to do with me, my anti-Zionism, it was only to do with the fact that I had mentioned students. But that story, that narrative about why they'd sacked me, collapsed entirely in, in, the, in the tribunal. So aren't um, university lecturers, professors, supposed to have tenure, which is a very strong, <coughs> strong... The idea is that basically you do have freedom of speech there and uh, that unless you are caught guilty of doing... Now, you know, it doesn't sound to me as if they've, they've followed their own rules. No, there's no such thing as tenure in the UK, never has been. But there are nevertheless strong protections in the law uh, uh, under academic freedom uh, and also under freedom of speech, which um, should protect someone from, from like, me from saying things which are obviously not racist and which are uh, simply an expression of uh, what are now regarded by the tribunal as protected views, anti-Zionist views. But they didn't understand or want to deal with that because of the pressure they were under. They also had people um, who were giving them money saying that they were going to stop giving them money, Zionist foundations. So they, they were under huge pressure and they, so they found a way to get rid of me. They thought it was defensible and it came to court and it fell apart around their feet. Now, what about the, the pressure on you? It must have been quite a fight. Uh, did you ever feel that, this and I just want to walk away from this? No, never. I mean, never for a second did I consider any such nonsense. I mean, the, 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 if, if you decide that you're, this is a difficult thing and you're going to try and apologise and be nice to them and see if we can all be friends, then you can, you can do that. I was never going to do that because I knew that that wouldn't work. 
then the strategy we adopted was to say, look, the, the, these are these are perfectly respectable anti-Zionist views. They might sound extreme to someone who believes in genocide in Gaza, but to me and to everyone else around the world who doesn't believe in genocide in Gaza, they're perfectly respectable. And, and in order to, dis- to establish that, we have to have a fight about this. And the fight was uh, at the court. And the tribunal decided that, yes, the anti-Zionist views of the sort I espouse are protected under the law, under the Equality Act, and you cannot be discriminated against because you've got anti-Zionist views, which the university, in their own evidence at the tribunal, effectively confirmed. I mean, extraordinary. Well, that, that is extraordinary. Can you take us through that? It almost sounds comic. <laughs> it was, I mean, this was, this was better than a soap opera. I mean... <laughs> The, the, there were four university witnesses, but I'll not bore you with all of the, uh, <laughs> the ins and outs. The first witness was uh, the retired professor who investigated me. And he admitted in the end that he hadn't followed the university's own rules and investigations, which was that you should investigate both sides of the allegations. <laughs> He'd only investigated the students' allegations and what effect it, my comments might have had on them, not what the, the greater context was and he admitted in the end that that was a mistake and he didn't even interrogate them on the, the, the obvious falsehoods which they told, told him uh, in their evidence uh, and so that, that was the first thing um, the second thing was that both he and the person who sacked me uh, uh, who's now gone on to a, a, a much better paid job in a different university Professor Jane Norman uh, they both conceded that uh, that it wasn't really the comments I'd made about students, about them work, working closely with the, the, the Zionist regime, uh, uh, p- and there being a question of whether they were pawns or not. That was me being polite, because, of course, they were active agents of the, the Zionist regime. So that it wasn't it wasn't those, que- those uh, comments which was the, the key thing. The key thing was that those comments were allied with anti-Zionist views, which is that re- Zionism is a racist colonial and genocidal ideology always has been and always will be will, will be and so hang, that, hang, on, hang on david because zionism isn't all hasn't always been genocidal you'll find many jews have gone to israel wishing to be p- at peace with the palestinians in fact there are you know, a few now who are actually very anti-racist vehemently right uh, au contraire. So <laughs> the, the most radical of the kibbutzim and uh, the kibbutzniks was, the, was an organization called Hashomer Hatzair, who had a, I mean, do you want this his, history lesson? Who had a, a series of, of kibbutzim, uh, in, including uh, who, who went to these kibbutzim? Bernie Sanders went there, uh, Tony Benn went there, the, 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 the Gail Gluckstein, who became Tony Glyph, who founded the Socialist Workers' Party, he was there, that's how he broke with Zionism, because he went to their kibbutzim. He wrote about the Hashem Hatzair in 1946, before the creation of the state of Israel, uh, de- denouncing them as being, as being, you know, all in favour of having Arab-only kibbutzim as well, but also all in favour of uh, evicting the Palestinians from their land, and they participated in the Nakba. So there, there were no Zionists who were anti uh, Zionist at the time, uh, who didn't want to... No, genocide is what uh, we're well, talking well, about here. Well, the Nakba was a genocide. Yes. The, the, the Nakba was a genocide, and there, was, there were no Zionists who did not want to participate in that. There was no faction of Zionists who did not want to and did not participate in it. The, the most radical of them participated as well, in, including in the elite Palmach of the Haganah. So, that's, right. so, so yes, always being genocidal things. That, that's, that's the view which is now protected in British law, right? Well, well done. Anyway, <laughs> let's go back to the tribunal. Who else were the witnesses? So, what did they say? So, so, the, the, so, the, so both of these witnesses, the, 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 um, the, guy, the retired Professor Banting who uh, investigated me and the, the Professor Norman who sacked me, both admitted that it was, my, it was the, the heinousness of my anti-Zionist comments as perceived by them and by the students, which was what, what led to me being sacked. And that, so they, they both... I admitted that the, the university's alleged reasons for sacking me were incorrect, and that was that was the first element of their case gone. Right, so they, so not only did they wrongly dismiss me because they didn't properly investigate, but they also sacked me because of my views. And then we came to the the best part <laughs> of the proceedings, and that was in the personage of Professor. Judith Squires, the second most senior person at the university, who is a professor of political theory, so ought to know a little bit about some of the matters we're about to discuss. And at the beginning of the case, the university had had come to the case accepting the two QC's reports they'd had, which said that I wasn't in any way anti-Semitic. And they they accepted that. And as soon as the case started, they said, oh, we want to change our minds about that. And so they changed their minds to say, because I was claiming that my ideas should be protected under law, they they came to the the case saying that 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 shouldn't be the case and that my ideas were not worthy of respect in a democratic society, which is the technical language in the Equality Act. 
So that, that was, a, that was a, a legal mistake, a fundamental legal mistake, which the university should really not have taken that advice from their council, but they did. So anyhow, here comes Professor Squires, the professor of political theory, the expert on Foucault and uh, all things post-structural. And she is asked by my council, so you think that Professor Miller's views are not worthy of respect in a democratic society? No, they're not. So you, you obviously think then that they're akin to fascism, and, which is the test, right? Your views are acceptable, and, uh, you know, worthy of respect if they're not akin to fascism. So the te- the te- the, what they had to establish was that my views were akin to fascism. And she looked startled. She didn't know how to answer that question. She wasn't expecting she it. She wasn't expecting it. And so my counsel said, but surely your counsel will have told you that that is the legal test, and that, this is, that is what you must be advancing. And she goes, oh, yes, his, his views are akin to Nazism. So, so that was it. She'd lost. But the best bit was the next bit, where he says, OK, so let's take you through a hypothetical example, Professor Squire. So let's imagine that the Anglo-Saxons of Britain excluded all of the non-Anglo-Saxons from the country and made them go and live in Car- Cardiff or in Cornwall. And, and the judge intervenes at this point and says, uh, Mr. Samur, that's my name of my barrister, uh, do you mean all of the non-Anglo-Saxons? And he goes, oh, no, 75%. And the remaining 25% get to stay in Britain, but they're denied equality in housing, in jobs, in access to democracy. Uh, and none of the ones who've been expelled can ever come back again. But every Anglo-Saxon anywhere in the world has a right to come and live in Britain. Would that be racist? He said. Yes, she says. <laughs> and would it be wrong for a professor to say Anglo-Saxonism is racism and it should be opposed? Oh, no, it wouldn't be wrong to say that. So she's completely contradicted herself. And it led to an amazing scene. She was, didn't know what to say, and she looked at this, the laptop. They had to break to get something written on paper, and they came back, and she said in a quiet voice, when asked, are Professor Miller's views akin to Nazism? She said, yes. And that was, that was their case demolished. They demolished it themselves. Amazing. Uh, what's the um, ramifications, do you think, for other, um, not just university lecturers but others that are, are threatened with cases of anti-semitism accused of anti-semitism the people in all sorts of broadcasting for example well this is a law which affects everybody in employment it doesn't just affect academics or journalists it affects everybody local council workers people in all sorts of in the private sector too you cannot discriminate against someone who has anti-zionist views on the basis of their anti-zionist views so it, it has very wide ramifications across the whole of the coming battle against the Zionists. You know, they're putting more and more pressure, having more and more people sacked, and this is a line in the sand where we can start to push well, back. Well, listen, this uh, case of yours um, at the university anyway started a long time before the genocide. Do you think that this is a sort of home front battle that's going on here that was actually started before the genocide and that this is premeditated? premeditated in, in what yeah. sense well in other words that um, the idea is to get the british academia um people of influence in in britain to be pro-israeli to get rid of pro-palestinians oh. i mean look what happened to jeremy corbyn for example before the genocide took place sure. because we have heard you know racist comments from the israeli government for many years and i'm, I'm just wondering whether they was they'd been planning what's going on now this genocide for a long time and thinking well we, you know we need to actually prepare the ground uh, by having a a battle against uh, pro-Palestinians in, in Britain in any influence, influential position? Well, I mean, I, I don't know that, it, that, that there was a specific genocide plan uh, in mind. Uh, that seems unlikely. But certainly they have been organising this way for a very, a very long period. I mean, they, the uh, uh, foreign minister of Israel, Abba Iban, famously said in 1972 in a speech in the, in the US that the uh, new anti-Semitism is anti-Zionism and that these two things are indistinguishable. And they've been trying to push that line ever since then. How can anti-Semitism be anti-Zionism? How can the two... I mean, how can you... You know, you, it's almost like you're saying that Zionists are not Jews. Well, what, what, what their line is is that, that, um, that anti-Zionists may claim that they're against a the political philosophy, but uh, secretly they're anti-Jewish. And they say they're anti-Zionists, but they're really secretly anti-Jewish. That's part of the story. And the other part of the story is that they say that, uh, that um, Jewish self-determination... Uh, is uh, an inalienable right of the Jewish people. And anyone who opposes Jewish self-determination, i.e. opposes genocide, is somehow racist. That's the, that's the end of their line. Uh, and, of course, it's ridiculous because, of course, you, J- Jewish self-determination does not require, cannot be allowed to require, should not be allowed to require genocide. It's completely o- 
obvious that that's the case. But nevertheless, they, they've push, pushed this line, pushed this line. It's, they've brought in the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's working definition of anti-Semitism, you know, d- developed by the Israeli government and then lodged in the IHRA as a weapon of choice. And then they populate their groups around the, the country, around the world, so that they've got boots on the ground to take complaints, to destroy Jeremy Corbyn, to attack Bernie Saunders, even though he's a Zionist himself, etc., etc. So the IHRA definition, where does that stand now after your case? Well, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because my, the judgment in my case drives a coach and horses through the idea that anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism are identical. They're not identical, according to, the British, according to British law now, <laughs> President British law. And I, I, I'm very, very pleased that I've been involved in doing that. <laughs> yeah. Martin, what do you make of this, uh, this question of David's case versus the genocide? Because I, 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 I mean, I'm, I've been watching this for many years. I've been accused of anti-Semitism myself back in, gosh, it was a long time ago, 19... 19- 90s and uh, i remember thinking well what's this about i'm starting to look over in the middle east now and saying well that's what it's about well um i mean regardless of whether your views are are correct or not it's surely just as political views to oppose the state of israel i mean it should be okay to oppose the existence of the state of israel uh, some, some people, I mean, plenty of people in mainstream Labour Party don't oppose the existence of the State of Israel. But it's not but it's just the State of Israel you're opposing, surely. It's, it's this political philosophy behind it. Well, it may be, yeah, but I mean, the point is, should Israel be allowed to exist? Now, Ernie Bevan, who used to be British Foreign Secretary, was firmly of the view that it shouldn't be allowed to exist. But he was overruled in Cabinet, and we've now got a Labour Party leadership which believes that the State of Israel has a right to exist. Now... I think the idea, it's, it's there now, just like the, the loyalists in Northern Ireland, they're there. Um, but nevertheless, it should just be regarded as political dispute. Some people think that Crimea is part of Ukraine. They genuinely believe that. It's ridiculous because most of the people in Crimea are Russian and voted in a referendum to leave the Ukraine. Several times, in fact. But those people have a political view that Ukraine is part of, uh, Crimea is part of Ukraine. That is a political view, whether you agree with it or you don't agree with it. And all that this court has said is that this is a protected political view. And it doesn't mean you have to agree with David Miller's view. Of course, of course. Well, I mean, but the, the idea that, that um, states have a right to exist is, is of course, a fanciful one. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I used to live in Scotland, and when, before I left Scotland to come down to England, I voted in a referendum to destroy the British state, i.e. To, to vote yes for Scottish independence. That would have broken up the British state. There's no inherent right of a state to exist, and at least of all states like the United Kingdom, which have several constituent parts which are sort of welded together by a sticky tape. But isn't it... Yeah, but hang on, it's a bit more than that. It's whether other countries recognize them isn't it it's whether the big superpowers recognize them then whether they accept, exchange ambassadors then you've got a state sure that's right but, but, but i mean the, but you don't the, have any right i mean if no one if someone <laughs> says i don't want to send you an ambassador then you don't have a state do you well, you have a, you have a state when you when you establish a state and uh, but there's, there's no right for it to 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 exist in the abstract that's the key question yeah so martin um what what do you make of um you know what's your take on the, the implications of of um, david's judgment this week well i think it is important because this international uh, definition which you know conflates zionism uh, and the state of israel with anti-semitism as you say it drives a coach and horses through it and of course british law is uh, case law so that becomes the law and that is a very strong you know I mean, in a way you've, you've obviously been given a very hard time here but you have in fact triumphed against those people who are trying to to use this kind of technique to silence dissent and it's that you can imagine that the the uk lawyers for israel are grinding their teeth this evening and as well they might uh, and of course they tried to close this little show down when we were on when we were on uh, bristol community radio uh, they're very active, these people. I mean, when, when you say the genocide, the genocide didn't start in this recent, uh, obviously it's gone in, the, yeah. the, the, a lot of, a lot of, uh, in, in the 1940s, the state was established on a massive m- murderous rampage of ethnic cleansing. Uh, you know, every bit as bad as what, what happened in Yugoslavia, and I used to be an aid worker, and the people who did that were rewarded. They, they became the leaders of the new state. They weren't sent to The Hague at all. And, of course, that's, that is the, the logic of, of, of Hamas fighting back from the other side, saying that's how states are established. 
you've absolutely got to be absolutely ruthless and if you win then you become a state and you can't be punished because you're you're too strong to be punished okay david can you drill into why it is that the british and the americans are so unequivocally supporting the israelis in this current genocide there seems to be something going on behind the scenes under the carpet if you want that that i can't see any benefit for britain i can't see any benefit for the united states what do you make of it well, I mean, it's clear that the U.S. and and the U.K., especially the U.S., has seen uh, Israel as being a valuable uh, weapon in West Asia uh, for some time. That, you know, as people say, you know, that, that sometimes the attack dog gets off the leash, and uh, Israel is well and truly off the leash. It's but, an important part of the world, just say geographically, isn't it? It's, it's very it, important. It's, it's important Where geographically, it's important yeah. in terms of, uh, of natural resources and in terms of the oil. But, of course, you know, the, the, the rest of the... West Asia, many of the, the states in West Asia, the Arab states, are themselves Western clients. So, so your, your question is is opposite, I would say. But look, the, what's going on here is that the Israelis are an expansionist regime. They want to ha- to ha- have a greater Israel, which they, in in their ambitions includes all of uh, Lebanon, Syria, uh, Jordan, parts of uh, Iraq, some parts, a little parts of Turkey, uh, Egypt as well. So they're, they're kind of imperialist, uh, attempting imperialist power. And there's, there's a question about how, wh- how far they will go along with their main sponsor, which of course is the US. And the, U- the US has got the same question. How far can it go along? Will it go along when the, uh, the Israelis are committing genocide? It's not that the US cares about the killing of thousands and thousands of Palestinian children. It's that its, it's, it's power calculuses have started to change because the, the, the power of the US is on the way down. And we see that obviously in the massive defeat they faced in Ukraine, but also in their inability to confront Ansar Allah in Yemen, where they, they've, they've done some demonstration attacks, but they've let it be known that they're not going to escalate against Ansar Allah because they're scared. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know if it, what about What about the religious aspect? Because this is something, you know, you've been looking to Islamophobia a lot, haven't you? There's obviously a religious aspect down there. Many of the people who are the victims of this genocide are, are not Muslims, but uh, the the whole idea of the Zionist state in Israel opposing the surrounding Muslim countries, particularly Iran, originally is almost at the heart of this. I, I would say that it, it is not at the heart of it, that, that, that geopolitics is the, is the most central thing, but there is a religious dimension to it, that's certainly the case. I mean, part of the part of the conflict there is over Al-Aqsa uh, is, a, is a religious conflict between Muslims and Jews over the significance of Al-Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock and uh, the, the, te- the building of the temple and all, all of that stuff. So that is part of it. Of course, the Zionists started off as being uh, a, a secularist movement uh, full of atheists, but there are now, of course, such a thing as religious Zionists who are part of Netanyahu's government, and uh, so that's part of the calculus. Yeah, but it's um, what I'm saying is this is the Holy Land, isn't it? This is almost like the uh, epicenter of uh, the Abrahamic faith here. Well, well it is. I mean, I mean, the, it's like they turned <laughs> it in. You know, this is they turned it into hell, in Gaza. Uh, it's just there is there. I'm just I'm trying just trying to drag you towards a bit of a spiritual dimension here. Well, uh, I mean, there is a spir- spiritual dimension to it. I mean, that, that's true. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of admitting that, right? So, you know, I mean, the the the, the so-called Hebron massacre in 1929. That, that there was a that was a religious conflict over the, over access to uh, both Al Aqsa Mosque and indeed uh, the uh, mosque in Hebron, the uh, the the the, mosque, the Abrahami mosque there, where, which had been where there had been incursions by um, radical religious Jewish settlers, and, and that was part of the part of the conflict there. So there is a, a, a dimension to that, and it, and the, if you look at the the, the sort of settler movement and the the temple movement who want to build the third temple, who see the coming of the Messiah, and this is what the Christian Zionists are all about. They're, they're best best of mates with the Zionists because they think that you know it's going to encourage the uh, Armageddon, and then of course the Jews will all be killed. That's their view, isn't it? Well, supposedly, uh, I mean, but also, I mean, what if if the if the boot was on the other foot? What if the um, the Zionists had taken over? I don't know somewhere like Mecca, which was a very important site of the um, uh, of the Muslims. Um, uh, you know, so if the boot was on the other foot, surely, I mean, you you can see why uh, the Israelis actually feel like that they want their own, you know, their own their own Jerusalem, their own temple, this sort of thing. Um, mm. 
this is surely at the heart of, heart of it. Like I come, I'm coming back again, saying, well, this is really surely they have their right to have that, don't they? Well, they have the right to expel the Muslims and uh, not well, they have, access, the, they have no. the right to maybe have a <laughs> agree with the Muslims to move their place. Well, they did, place. Have, they did have agreements, but they, they haven't anymore because of the, the the occupation. I mean, there was a chance, wasn't there, back in the 1990s with Rabin? It seems that uh, I don't think, no, I don't no, think really, so, no, to, to have I, a no, peace agreement. I, I, he was he was assassinated. He was assassinated by the by the far right settlers. Yes, of course, but, friend of Netanyahu, apparently. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, look, there there, there, there was a chance. Um, prior to Zionism, I mean the early settlements, going back, and you know, there were, let's remember there were Jews there, um, not um, in an unbroken line, but you know before the creation of the Zionist movement, and and they lived uh, cheap by jail. This is what the guys from Natura Carter are always banging on about, you know, that they didn't want a Jewish state, they lived with the the Muslims, they were friends, and there wasn't an imperialist project, and it's what Zionism that brings the imperialist project, and of course it, it affects all of the Jews, regardless whether they're anti-Zionist or not. Uh, okay, we are just looking at a report on Declassified UK um, by Matt Kennard uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, he's saying that actually Israeli aircraft have been landing here in Britain, that US aircraft landing here in Britain, and we are complicit in this genocide. Well, of course we are. I mean, the, the, um, Britain is not as complicit as the US, but it clearly is complicit. I mean, the, the, the uh, involvement of the SAS, uh, certainly in Cyprus, we don't if, know if they've been in Gaza or directly, like some of the uh, U.S. special forces have been. There have been intelligence flights, as, as Matt uh, and others at Declassified have been reporting, uh, from the bases. And remember, there's British military bases in Cyprus still, and uh, they've been flying intelligence flights, no doubt sharing the intelligence uh, with uh, with the Zionists and with the Israelis. I mean, that, yes, of course, that's compl- complicity, and that, that means that the you know Rishi Shunak should be going to the Hague along with Netanyahu and Gallant and Herzog. It's been a bit of a double-edged sword this week, though, hasn't it? Because we've had the results of the Elbit 7 trial here in Bristol as well. These are people from Palestine Action who were taking direct action against um, the this Israeli firm, Elbit, which are manufacturing drones and all sorts of other hideous... Uh, well, I mean, stuff that's being used for genocide. Battle-tested on Palestinian children, yes. Yeah, So, and this is one of the ways they actually sell the stuff, is they say, well, we do test this on civilian populations, yeah. blah, blah. Uh, so what do you make of that trial? It's very, it's, and apparently the, the, their defence was that we had consent to do it, which is a pity because uh, certainly the historic trials I remember, the, 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 de- the defences they were using were things like trying to stop a greater crime. Yeah, I mean, this is the jury trial... Um the jury, by all accounts, weren't very engaged with the defendants, um, and who knows what there was in their minds. But we haven't got to sentencing yet. We don't know if they'll be custodial sentences or not. Uh, the, so far, almost all of the Palestine Action people who've been charged with things, and there's been a lot of them, have got have got off, have been found not guilty because of, uh, of their defence that they're trying to commit a larger crime, which has been accepted by many juries up and down the country. But Palestine Action is the cutting edge of the Palestine Solidarity Movement in this country, and we should be all be doing all we can to to support their actions, including, of course, donating to the the uh, crowdfunders they've got. Some of them haven't got legal aid uh, and are faced with l- large legal bills, so it's important that people. Uh, find out about the uh, Elbert Seven and about Palestine Action, because that's that's the kind of cutting edge of uh, Palestine solidarity uh, work in this country. I think a lot of these things do depend. I mean, obviously, you know, you are advising your lawyer. It helps to be a sociologist when you're doing that. Um, but uh, how how on earth do you go about finding a decent lawyer in a case like this? I mean, for, for some sometimes people will be just going, oh gosh, you know, suddenly uh, they'll grab the first lawyer that comes along. Is it not, not an easy job? That's not a good idea. Uh, you know, you need to to fight to take advice on who's the who's the best lawyer to, to take. I mean, I you know I'm involved with an organisation called the Left Legal Fighting Fund, which was set up founded by Chris Williamson when he was uh, uh, drummed out of the Labour Party and uh, found and which used money that they won in, he won in court from the Labour Party to set it up and has been supporting a number of big cases. So you know, organisations like that or Palestine Legal in the US or the European Legal Centre. Uh, in Brussels, they they can all advise on, on good lawyers. Sometimes they can help, so I would v- advise doing that. I mean, the, the legal team I have, uh, Zilla Raman from Raman Law, has has been fantastic and uh, very supportive from the beginning. And Zach Samur, who's himself Palestinian, uh, as the barrister, I mean, who, who's the one who absolutely destroyed uh, Professor Squires in court? I, I mean, that was just a joy to see. But they they've been they're committed and they're knowledgeable. I have had other lawyers during this process over the last four years, uh, and so, some of them have not 
been as as well versed in the politics of this, in particular those who had, for example, just employment law specialisms, which of course this, this is an employment law quick case, but you need to know the politics and uh, it's important in a case like this that you have um, legal counsel who are absolutely abreast of and, and sensitive to the politics of this as they were. So you're going to get your job back? Uh, well, let's see. And we've got a remedies hearing, and the, the the judge will be determining how much money I get and uh, what kind of compensation there is, and whether the university has to take me back. All of those questions, I think, are are, are up for discussion. Let, but let's see. Um, I mean, normally they don't, do they? They will normally rather pay you off and get rid of you rather Norm- than. Normally, that's the case. Yeah. yeah. Normally, court, court, courts don't uh, require um, people to be taken back, but it's, it's not unheard of. Has this affected your career? Do you think? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, even after be, I've been cleared and for the fourth time, fourth investigation, I, I doubt I'm going to get an academic job in the UK again. I mean, you know, I, I'm not averse to trying, but it's, you know, it's obviously it's, it's totally changed my career. I'm now uh, I work in journalism and, and uh, I still I still do academic research if you like, but it's uh, geared towards my show Palestine Declassified and writing for to various websites, and uh, you know, so I, I I've kind of taken a different trajectory and that's, that's allowed me actually to spend much more of my time investigating Zionism than I would otherwise have been able to do had I been in a, a university I was going job. to ask you that because you know you would have thought a lot of your research work has gone down the pan now if you're this kind of media character No not at all I mean I, I, I mean, the, the work I do and the journalism I do is based on research I mean our show Palestine Declassified is based on research we break stories all the time uh, because we do investigations uh, uh, unlike, uh, unlike actually many academics or indeed many journalists can you explain to listeners what sociology is? What attracted you to it? What attracted me to sociology was the fact that, well, I, I mean, I, I mean, let's put it this very crudely. I mean, I, I, when I started to do sociology, I realised that some of the weird things that I thought about the world were actually true. <laughs> and so, well, such as, you know, about inequality, about imperialism. Uh, and I, I realised there was a body, a whole body of thought and of ideas which actually engaged with the, the feelings I had growing up uh, in, in Edinburgh uh, and, uh, and uh, experiencing the conflict in Ireland and, and the Falklands War and, and all of that. And how, did I, how would I make sense of that? And, and actually, I alighted upon a, a discipline which I believe is way better at understanding those questions than any other discipline, including political science. Yeah, brilliant. Anyway, uh, just to round up, we're going to have a listen now to General Wesley Clark. He was on uh, the... Uh, uh, BBC's Channel 4 News last week talking about what's going on in Gaza. I'd love, love to get both of you's reaction to he introduces he introduced me to the idea of uh, escalation dominance that the Americans want to have in the Middle East. I spoke to the retired US general and former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO Wesley Clark. I asked him what action he thinks the US should now take. In a crisis like this, you have to uh, take the initiative away from the uh, enemy. What I would call it is you have to establish escalation dominance. You keep apologizing for escalating and they keep hitting. So you got to hit back so hard that they say, okay, we've had enough. We're not going to strike back again. And uh, that means you must go to the source. And the source is Iran. So you have to pick out the targets in Iran that will dissuade the uh, Revolutionary Guards and the Ayatollahs from continuing this campaign. So so, so that does mean that you're talking about strikes in Iran itself on Iranian territory? That's right. That, that, That would be, if I were in the chain of command, that's what I'd be recommending because the tit for tat doesn't work. And we know that historically. We saw this when I was a young officer in Vietnam. Tit for tat doesn't work. You want to make a difference, you must use decisive force. Take out these small outposts. Take them out. Don't strike once. Go back again and again. But you must also go to the source, and that source is Iran. The Iranian government is in deep trouble. Uh, Most of the people don't want it there, but they can't get rid of it. So I keep hearing from my Iranian friends, send the B-52s in. Now, we're not going to send any B-52s in, I don't think. But uh, this is a time where the United States has to uh, establish its escalation dominance over Iran. Right. And, 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 and how do you factor in American domestic politics here? Because you have Donald Trump uh, saying President Biden is leading you into World War III uh, and saying none of this would have happened had he been president. 
Uh, how does that change the calculation as to what to do? Well, I think that it's it's inevitable that there will be some effort on the part of politicians to to make some domestic hay out of this. Uh, and, but but I think statesmen have to rise above the domestic politics. And I think this is a case where uh, President Biden has to choose what's right for the country. And, you know, you have to be careful how you read this, because uh, when I talk to Muslim Americans uh, in the United States and Iranian Americans, what they're looking for from the president is strength. They're not looking for compromise. They know what the Iranian government's about. They know what its intent is. So uh, they're looking to see a president who uh, exhibits strength. It hasn't happened in Ukraine. And that started the slide. Really, Afghanistan did. And then Ukraine. And so what they see is an American administration which doesn't respond with the full force which is capable. And they attribute it to timidity. They're looking for strong leadership. So I think the domestic politics of this are that the president will come out better politically, at home and abroad, if he responds more strongly. So that's U.S. former General um, Wesley Clark there talking about imagining himself into the U.S. chain of command, David, um, with this idea of uh, escalation dominance and particularly about hitting Iran. Well, I, I've already alluded to what's actually going on here, and that is that the, the U.S. power is declining by the day. They can't even uh, contain Anzarella. Let me let me talk about that for a second. So the, in, answer, in the case of Ansarallah, who run the government of Yemen and who took most of the weapons and most of the army uh, as part of the civil war and the ar- weapons that had been supplied by the Saudis and of course eventually they'd, been, they'd come from the Americans. So Ansarallah has a huge supply of weaponry, not just uh, from uh, uh, from Iran, but also from captured from the from the Saudis, and what the Americans did when the Ansarullah started the blockade against boats going to Israel or Israeli boats was that they 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 said that they were going to create this thing called Operation Protect Prosperity, and uh, I mean I, I think that the, the person who came up with that slogan should have been paid better, you know. <laughs> and uh, what happened then was the U.S. Navy said, "Guys, we haven't got enough boats to do this," and then. Uh, Spain, Italy and France said, ah, guys, we're out, we're not, we're not part of this. And then the Americans let it be known through the pages of the New York Times that they were scared of uh, bombing Ansarallah seriously because what could happen in principle, they thought, was that Ansarallah might st- sink some US Navy ships. Well, of course they'd do that. Of course that's what would happen. These are, and that, you know, and that reveals the whole, the whole charade of uh, US global power is that actually the projection of power by the US Navy is no more than floating metal hulks which are targets for uh, for sophisticated weaponry which the, which Ansarallah absolutely have so they they were they're scared that Ansarallah will sink one two three four lots of their boats in the Red Sea and in the Mediterranean and that is really the end of the idea of American power um, the, the British have just decided they're going to pull HMS Diamond out. Uh, it's very well defended and a very modern ship and put an older ship in, which isn't so well defended. You, I mean, I, I looked at that and I thought, is, the, uh, is this bait that they're sticking in there? It's, I mean, it, it's crazy. I mean, the, the Americans... It's ra- just the Red Sea we're talking about. The Americans rang up Ansarallah and said, guys, we're about to bomb X, Y and Z. And Ansarallah said, thanks very much, guys. And they evacuated the bases and then the bombs came. I mean, it's a, this is tit for tat. As, as he says, they cannot escalate to dominance. They haven't got the ability. Yes, they've got bases all over the place, but these are uh, you know, effectively isolated groups of, uh, of US soldiers, 13,000 in Qatar, 2,500 in Syria, etc. And, uh, and the, what, the ones in Syria and in Iraq, the, the Iraqi parliament has declared that they should all leave and the, the, the Iraqi resistance not just the Iraqi armed forces the Iraqi resistance Islamic resistance 23 separate factions is conducting a war against all of those, those bases in both Syria and Iraq and indeed attacking Israel in the Golan Heights so there's a, there's a real pressure that, that the, Amer- the, uh, uh, the on Israel and the Americans cannot staunch the pressure they cannot take the pressure away and that's the problem they've got well to be fair to Krishnan Guru Murthy he then said well what about the idea of just persuading the Israelis to stop bombing Gaza? And uh, well, Wesley, well, Wesley Clark's, oh, no, 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 I don't think we should be doing that. I'll put the full clip up on our show page at thisweek.org.uk. But anyway, where is this Gaza Red Sea thing in the Middle East heading, do you think? Well, I, th- I mean, I think that, that uh, 
Alex the Flood, when it was launched, that was a moment where I think many people saw the weakness and potential weakness of the Zionist project. That if if uh, the Palestinian factions, it wasn't remember, it wasn't just Gaza, it wasn't just Hamas, it was Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the Popular Front and the Democratic Front and all those organisations. And the the events since then have only confirmed my view that that actually the Zionist entity is very very fragile. They're being kicked uh, by the resistance in Gaza. They're scared of going into Lebanon because uh, last time they went into Lebanon, they were kicked out of Lebanon by Hezbollah and Hezbollah are, are immeasurably stronger now than they were then. There's, of course, pressure from Syria, from uh, Iraq, from Ansarullah. Uh, and, you know, the, the escalation um, ladder, as the axis of resistance, the so-called axis of resistance puts it, means that, that you will have Iran drawn further and further into this conflict directly. And once you've done that, there is no possibility of them, uh, the Israelis breaching the, the boycott which Ansarallah have uh, instituted because, of course, they've, they've breached it by goods uh, arriving through Saudi and then Jordan. And, that, and the, the Iranians will close all that down and there will be no possibility of them breaking that siege. And that's the, that's the end of the Zionist project. But, I mean, surely this attack on the 7th of October was a disaster. I mean, look at the – you look at the um, the kill ratio. It's something like 100 to 1, 100 Palestinians killed for every Israeli that was killed on the 7th of October. And, of course, many of them have been taken as hostages and are being killed by Israeli U.S. bombs right now. Sure. I mean, that, that's absolutely true. It's a genocide, isn't it? It's an appalling genocide. But but militarily, they're not defeating uh, the Palestinian resistance factions. That's the interesting thing. I mean, we've uh, many of us, I guess, have seen the, the footage of these Merkava tanks being blown up by guys in, in flip flops and uh, barefoot, and, and that's uh, that's an ongoing process where their their, their forces are being degraded at, at a rate of knots. Uh, thanks very much, David. I don't know if you can uh, just give us your uh, social media contacts and so people are interested in following what you're up to. So on, on X, formerly Twitter, I am tracking underscore power. And if you want to donate to my crowdfunder, because I still have quite a lot of legal costs outstanding, it's at fightingfund.org. And if they want to find out who those lawyers are, seem to do quite a, quite a good job, <laughs> didn't they? David Miller, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, Martin, we're going to hear now from Wesley Clark, but a long time ago, same Wesley Clark, talking about uh, some plans revealed to him in the Pentagon to invade and attack seven countries in five years. I went back there to see Don Rumsfeld. I'd worked for him as a White House fellow in the 1970s. All this is in the book. And, um, and I said, am I doing okay on CNN? He said, yeah, 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 fine. He said, uh, I'm thinking about it. He says, I read your book. And uh, he said, uh, this is a book that talks about the Kosovo campaign. And he said, I just want to tell you, he said, nobody's going to tell us where or when we can bomb. Nobody. Well, uh, he said, thanks. That's all the time I've got. I went downstairs. I was leaving the Pentagon, and an officer from the Joint Staff called me into his office and said, I, I want you to know, he said, sir, we're going to attack Iraq. And I said, why? He said, we don't know. He said, uh, I said, well, did they tie Saddam to 9-11? He said, uh, no. He said, but um, I guess it's, they don't know what to do about terrorism. And so uh, the, it, they, they think, but they can attack states and they want to look strong. And so I guess they think if they take down a state, it will intimidate the terrorists and you know, it's like that old saying he said, if the only two you have is a hammer, then every problem has to be a nail. Well, I walked out of there pretty upset. And then um, we attacked Afghanistan. I was pretty happy about that. We should have. And then I came back to the Pentagon about six weeks later. I saw the same officer. I said, why, uh, why haven't we attacked Iraq? We still going to attack Iraq? He said, oh, sir. He says, it's worse than that. He said... Um, he pulled up a piece of paper off his desk. He said, I just got this memo from the Secretary of Defense's office that says we're going to attack and destroy the governments in, in seven countries in five years. We're going to start with Iraq, and then we're going to move to Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. I said, seven, seven countries in five years. I said, is that a classified memo? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, don't show it to me. He was about to show it to me. He said, because I want to talk about it. And... I, I, I sat on this information I, for a long time, for about six or eight months. I, I was so stunned by this, I couldn't begin to talk about it. And I couldn't believe it would really be true, but that's actually what happened. Uh, these people took control of the policy in the United States. And I realized then, it came back to me, a 1991 meeting I had with Paul Wolfowitz. 
You know, in 2001, he was Deputy Secretary of Defense, but in 1991, he was the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. It's the number three position in the Pentagon. And I had gone to see him when I was a one-star general. I was commanding the National Training Center. I had met him one time. He said, if you ever get to Washington, come look me up. They always say that. Well, I was there in Washington. It was a Friday afternoon. I'd visited Colin Powell. He'd given me five minutes of his precious time and sent me on my way, and I was bored in the Pentagon, and, and I thought, I'll just go. Who can I see? I'll, I think I'll see Wolfowitz. So I called, and up there, he was available. Scooter Libby came to the door. I met Scooter for the first time, and he brought me in, and uh, I said to Paul, I said, and this is 1991, I said, Mr. Secretary, you must be pretty happy with the performance of the troops in, in Desert Storm, and he said, uh, well, yeah, he said, but, but not really, he said, because the truth is we should have gotten rid of Saddam Hussein, and we didn't. And this was just after the Shia uprising in, in March of 91, which we had provoked, and then we kept our troops on the sidelines and didn't intervene. And he said, but one thing we did learn, he said, we learned that we can use our military in the region, in the Middle East, and the Soviets won't stop us. He said, and we've got about five or ten years to clean up those old Soviet client regimes, Syria, Iran, Iraq, before the next great superpower comes on to challenge us. This country was taken over by a group of people with a policy coup. Wolfowitz and Cheney and Rumsfeld and you could name a half dozen other collaborators from the Project for a New American Century. They wanted us to destabilize the Middle East, turn it upside down, make it under our control. It went back to those comments in 1991. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, if you're an American, you ought to be concerned about the strategy of the United States in this region. What is our aim? What is our purpose? Why are we there? Why are Americans dying in this region? That is the issue. Well, he's changed his tune, hasn't he? Uh, so, yeah, there's a little gap at the end there, but it, it, I, I just took a bit out where it was some waffly talk. And uh, amazing that it's how someone can sort of turn themselves on their heads from saying, you know, why are Americans dying there to now encouraging war with Iran? Well, obviously, we'll have to look into the personal development of that individual. Um, I or maybe think, he got his knuckles wrapped, eh? Well, it's quite likely that he was probably, you know, words were had and he was told to get in line. But and I do of find he's now, he's, now, he's now overcompensating for his previously somewhat critical views by being, uh, you know, the loudest cheerleader for the pointless war with Iran he seems to want. Yeah, and so what's the motivation behind that, one wonders. Anyway, look, the um, the point here is... The U.S. is a very peculiar place in a way in that they kind of wear their heart on their sleeve, don't they, to, to a large extent. They're, they're quite open about um, these in encouragement of the genocide, this sort of thing. I remember, for example, um, John McCain, Senator John McCain, was just a totally gung-ho. But the thing is, if you're trying to be successful in war and geopolitics, you do have to play your cards rather close to your chest. They don't seem to bother at all. Well, it's it's a narcissistic yeah. element of no, their you're culture. Right. You're right. They only talk to themselves, so they don't really listen to anything, anybody, anything, any yeah. what anybody else says. And it's all seen. It's everything is everything is thought of in terms of their needs, their exceptionalism, America, the only the the indispensable nation, all of that stuff. And of course, that's mirrored in in the in the in the the the. the, the the eschatological views of these Zionist leadership. And of course in Britain, what we've got is, well, we just do that, don't we? I mean, we all, we go to war. I mean, Britain has been going to war all over the world for hundreds of years. It's just what we do. It's part of who we are. So that's, you know, all three countries have got essentially narcissistic aspects to their collective personalities.